Greetings, one and all. Um, so this lecture is going to look at the factors strengthening apartheid um, during the 1960s. So by way of introduction, in apartheid, as we know, is a system of legalized racial discrimination, which has existed in South Africa between 1948 and 1994. The word in Afrikaans literally means separateness, um, reflecting the Afrikaner ideology that each race had its own separate place and role in God's plan um, and that racial mixing therefore was to the detriment of all. So under the, uh, the, the apartheid ideology, the country's population was divided up into four racial groups, each of which had different citizenship rights. So only whites were allowed to vote in parliamentary elections, for example, and there were severe restrictions on where each racial group was allowed to live and work. Now the 1960s was something of uh, a kind of in a perverse way, a golden era for apartheid with very little overt mass resistance uh, of the type which was seen in the 1950s during the defiance campaign, for example, um, or of the type that would later re-emerge um, from the 1970s onwards, um, in the 1970s with the black consciousness movement that we will go on to study in the coming weeks. Indeed, the 1960s is sometimes known uh, in South African uh, history as the quiet decade for this reason, for this kind of lack of overt uh, mass resistance. Now this lecture will look at two of the main factors behind um, why this was the case. On the one hand, government repression and on the other, economic growth. So to begin with, let's look at uh, repression. So just by way of background, by say 1961, repression had already uh, dealt major blows to the resistance movement. So first of all, he had legislation passed in the 1950s, a lot of legislation that had given the gov government a solid armory of powers, um, which was used to crack down on dissent, uh, all of which would be used then with abandon uh, in the 1960s. So in 1950, you had the Suppression of Communism Act, uh, which gave the government to, the power to ban organizations. Um, you had in 1953, the Public Safety Act, which enabled the government to declare a state of emergency and suspend the rule of law which they then used following the Sharpeville massacre to do precisely that. Um, in 1956, you had the Official Secrets Act, uh, which introduced government censorship. And throughout the 1960s then, uh, the government was able to use all of this repressive legislation um, to ban, censor and int intimidate its, op its opponents. Um, so it already had this le legal uh, basis for, for repression that was then used in the 1960s. So the ANC and the PSC, PSC were banned, which we'll look at a bit more later on. Um, state of emergencies were declared and so on. But this was all building on the powers that the government had granted itself through legislation over the pre previous decade. Um, uh, another uh, another example of, of, of repression was uh, the Sharpeville massacre, which happened in March 1960. Um, in which, as we know, at least 69 people were shot dead. Um, these were unarmed demonstrators, uh, and many of them were shot in the back as they tried to flee. And this demonstrated very clearly that the protests would not be tolerated, and this would have likely scared away many people from taking part in protests. So this too strengthened apartheid um, over the following decade. And then, as I referred to earlier, the following month, April 1960, the ANC and the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress and the African National Congress, two leading anti-apartheid organizations for Africans, were both banned. They were both banned. <clears throat> so this made it impossible to pursue ordinary legal methods of political campaigning. And it meant, for example, their members could not uh, publish or distribute written material or even be quoted in the press. Um, they could be banished to certain parts of the country, isolated, secluded parts of the country, forbidden to leave those areas and forbidden to address public meetings. So this had a, a major effect as well on, on, on hamstringing the anti-apartheid movement, ensuring that it was unable to operate openly, unable to operate effectively in, in terms of legal, peaceful campaigning. It's just That was just banned. Uh, so that strengthened apartheid as well. Um, <clears throat> so. That was all already the case by 1961. You'd had the Sharpeville massacre sending the, 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 the message to, uh, to people that the, the, the pro protests would not be tolerated. You had the ANC and PAC banned. You'd had all this repressive legislation built up over the previous decade. Moving on then from 1961 onwards, you have 
1963, you had the Ravonia trial, um, which again had an effect in strengthening apartheid. So following their banning, the following year, both organizations, ANC and PAC, set up armed organizations to um, challenge apartheid through um, armed struggle. Um, but in 1963, the headquarters of the so-called MK, Umkunto Wisizwe, um, the ANC's armed group, was raided and 17 of its leaders were imprisoned. And they were then, uh, they were actually put on trial and given life imprisonment in the Ravonia trial in 1963 sentence sent to a place called Robben Island became infamous as the site where political prisoners were held during the apartheid uh, era. And then other leaders then obviously fearing the, the same fate, they then fled the country. Uh, people like Oliver Tambo most famously fled the country. So what the Ravonia trial uh, and the subsequent imprisonment and exile of the ANC leadership did was effectively stripped the ANC of its leadership. They were taken out of action unable to communicate with each other or with their supporters. And the combined effect of the banning uh, and the imprisonment and exile of the leadership meant the ANC virtually ceased to exist as a functioning organization. It had already been made illegal, and now its leadership was, was out of, taken out of the picture through imprisonment and exile. Um, this was then bolstered uh, by the fact that ANC President Albert Latuli um, was then banished to Zululand until his death in 1967, despite the fact he was not part of the MK, he was not part of the armed wing, and actually was a committed pacifist who had opposed the ANC's turn to armed struggle. But nevertheless, so even, even this pacifist wing of the ANC, the point here is, was, um, was effectively silenced. He was banished. Um, so the whole ANC leadership was, was, was taken out of, the, out of the picture. In terms of the PAC, um, Robert Sabukwe also was, was imprisoned uh, on Robben Island until 1969, and then subsequently placed under house arrest until his death uh, in 1978. So um, <clears throat> so the Ravonia trial and the imprisonment and so on of, of the leadership, again, had a, had a major effect. This is another uh, key example of repression, strengthening apartheid through basically hampering the ability of the resistance to organize itself. Um, and then finally, in terms of, of, of repression, we've got to look at the, um, the, the role of the police and the increasing impunity with which the police were able to operate under the leadership of um, B.J. Vorster, per, first as Minister of Justice throughout the first half of the 1960s and then from 1966 onwards as Prime Minister. Um, so on the issue of, of, of police then, to start with, apartheid legislation was rigorously enforced. Uh, prosecutions under the past laws doubled during the 1960s to 700,000 per year by 1968. Um, it's interesting, if you go back to the 1950s, this is a slight uh, diversion here, but the 1950s, of course, the defiance campaign, the aim of it, uh, um, and in 1960 with the, with the past laws protests, the aim was to make apartheid unenforceable by m overwhelming the courts and the justice system and the police by forcing them to have to arrest so many people as th that, that it became unworkable, unpractical. Um, defiance campaign, eight and a half thousand people were arrested. Uh, and it's, it's interesting, this strategy, you can see how this strategy was perhaps a little misguided. If they were able, the courts and the police were able to deal with 700,000 arrests under past laws per year, and that didn't bring the court system to its knees or grind it to a halt or anything, then that shows really um, the power that the government had. They were perfectly able to deal with hundreds of thousands, literally, of arrests without it overwhelming their, their system. So that's just a, a side point, really. But the point is, these, apart these apartheid laws were, were rigorously enforced. Vorster made it clear that transgressions would not be overlooked, and this certainly strengthened apartheid by ensuring it did not become unenforceable. Now, Vorster was responsible for the creation of the General Laws Amendment Act um, of 1963, I believe, uh, which increased the powers of the police to act against opposition activists by introducing imprisonment without trial. So police could imprison suspects without trial for up to 90 days initially. That was later increased to 180 days. And then under the 1967 Terrorism Act, this was increased to indefinitely. The police could lock people up without trial for as long as they considered necessary. Um, the General Laws Amendment Act also introduced solitary confinement. So this was a really significant step along South Africa's path to becoming a police state. Um, 
the outcome of the treason trial, remember, in 1961, in which all defendants were found not guilty, had really showed that the judiciary maintained still a degree of independence from the apartheid government. Um, but Vorster's laws ensured the police no longer had to rely on the judges to imprison activists. They could simply imprison them themselves. So really we see during this period, power to imprison being handed from the judges who are still relatively independent to the police who were solidly under the control of the um, apartheid government and, and under the Ministry of Justice led until 66 by Vorster. Um, so this, this is a massive expansion of the police powers. They, they don't have to rely on judges anymore to, to get people in prison. They can decide themselves. They become the judge, effectively, over this period. Um, special branch, as well, was expanded under Vorster's watch and effectively became a law unto themselves, as well, specialising in the torture, abuse and disfigurement of those under their interrogation. So in 1968, a new police headquarters was established in Johannesburg, known as John Vorster Square. Um, two floors of this building were used by Special Branch for their interrogations, and the building became synonymous with abuse and brutality, it became Im absolutely infamous during this time. Indeed, eight detainees um, never, never uh, survived their time there. They were basically tortured to death. Um, they were killed during their detention in jo John Vorster Square. So through these methods, Vorster's police uh, were able to keep tabs on the resistance, uh, keep a watch on the resistance by forcing information um, about the networks and so on through their methods of torture. They were able to build up enough of a picture of underground ANC, MK and PAC, POCO activity as to effectively snuff out the work of these organizations. Indeed, Vorster's methods as Minister of Justice were seen as so successful that he was made Prime Minister in 1966 following Vort's assassination. So we see the combination of the repressive legislation, the impact of the, uh, uh, the Sharpeville massacre, the Ravonia trial, and then the massive expansion of police powers under Vorster really combined to, to, as I say, push South Africa very strongly in the direction of becoming a police state, um, uh, where, where police, as I say, are basically judges unto themselves during this period. Uh, so repression played certainly a major part in quashing the activities of the ANC, the PAC, um, decapitating them, removing their leadership, um, and thereby strengthening apartheid um, significantly during this period. However, that's not the whole story. Um, second major factor is economic growth. Now, the economy grew uh, at a relatively rapid rate of 5% per year uh, during the 1960s. Unemployment declined to less than 10%. While wages grew by around 25% for the African population of South Africa during the 1960s. Um, so, economic growth, what it did, it created new job opportunities for Africans, including in areas outside the low waged mining and farming industries in, in which they'd traditionally been employed. So, jobs in manufacturing, for example, um, doubled to over one and a half million between 1951 and 1975. And the number of Africans employed in white collar work, office work, you know, non manual work, uh, increased sixfold, six times over, to almost half a million over the same period. Um, foreign investment played a large part uh, in this economic boom, in part, so there's a link between repression and economic growth, because part of the reason for foreign investment was that they were reassured by Vorster's security measures that their investments would be protected and would, would, would not be subject to strikes and, and, and protests and so on. Um, and as a, partly as a result, foreign businesses doubled their investment in the country over the course of the decade. So this played a role in the growth as well. At the same time, the color bar was loosened in the construction industry. The color bar was what prevented people from certain races uh, taking part in certain jobs. This was loosened in the construction industry, giving Africans access to higher paid, skilled work in this area. Um, and the construction indus industry incidentally was boosted by the creation of the new townships, which were commissioned under the terms of the Group Areas Act, which removed Africans from so-called white areas and then established new townships that were sort of designated African areas on the edges of cities. This required building and that created jobs uh, for Africans in the construction industry. Also the implementation of the 1959 Bantu Self-Government Act, uh, which sought to develop the rural reserves <coughs> into independent African homelands ultimately, 
This led to jobs being created in the so-called native administrations as well. So each of these uh, 10 reserves or so-called homelands, uh, the designated areas that Africans, was, Africans were supposed to live, was supposed to have its own kind of system of self-government. So th that, that, that created a certain amount of jobs as well. Many in the Africans in these areas were able to find work in things like nurseries, schools, creches, hospitals, and the government, government bureaucracies that were created as part of the drive to so-called separate development. And finally, these new jobs and rising wages has the, had the effect of uh, boosting demand for other industries as well. This is what the economist Keynes, for those of you studying economy, will know called the multiplier effect. So with many Africans now uh, in receipt of a disposable income for the first time, small businesses then emerge to cater for this growing African market, selling cleaning materials, clothing, radios, drinks, cigarettes, etc., cetera, um, to Africans with money to spend. So these industries were then themselves a further source of job opportunities. So you had the, the kind of governmental infrastructure being established in, in the homelands. You had the construction of new townships. You had foreign investment. Um, you had manufacturing. Uh, you had white collar work. All of this work was producing more jobs, leading to rising wages. And these developments led to the growth of a new African middle class uh, whose living conditions were comfortable despite their exclusion from political life, they were still denied access to the vote and so on, um, but their living conditions were becoming more com comfortable uh, for, for a certain section of African society. So econo economic opportunities combined with rising wages meant there was simply less incentive for resistance. Why would people risk their freedom by protesting or joining an underground movement when they were perfectly able to put food on the table and make a decent living by keeping their head down. So it was not that Africans had become accommodated to apartheid during the 1960s um, <clears throat> or accepted it or anything like that, but it was the case that their own living conditions were not so bad as to drive them into resistance out of sheer desperation. So in this sense, economic growth played a large part in deterring resistance and thus stabilizing.